Hello and welcome to tonight's uh, CG Signature Lecture and the keynote address for the 2012 Japan Futures Initiative Spring Symposium, the inaugural symposium of the Japan Futures Initiative. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International mm -hmm. Affairs, and it's my uh, pleasure to be your host tonight. Uh, to our uh, audience in the room, welcome. Some of you have come from a very, very long way away to be with us today and tomorrow. And to our web audience, welcome as well. Some of you are also a very long way away. Japan Futures Initiative is a, a new enterprise based here at the University of Waterloo, but not solely at the University of Waterloo. The purpose of which is to help re-energize the policy-relevant social scientific study of Japan. As those of us who follow trends in international studies have noticed, uh, interest in Japan as a subject of serious social scientific research has declined quite dramatically over the past 10 years or so, primarily as a result of uh, the experience of Japan having been in decline itself from the heady days of the economic bubble in the 1980s and 1990s. And as a result of China's rise and Korea's skillful entrepreneurship in the cultivation of interest in the research about Korea overseas, a lot of resources have been, uh, have been steered towards the study of China and Korea in the last decade and away from Japan. Uh, while this might be understandable in a, a simple psychological sense, uh, it's my view and the view of my colleagues who've been engaged in the process of cultivating the Japan Futures Initiative uh, that this is a serious mistake for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first and most important of which is that there is no better or more important time for those of us in OECD countries to be studying Japan. Because Japan is at the forefront of all of the challenges that Canada, the United States, most European countries, Australia, New Zealand are all going to be facing very shortly. Uh, declining population, uh, steady state or declining economic uh, growth, uh, aging population, uh, energy shortages. Japan is the country that is going to confront these things uh, first. Japan is a country of great, great resourcefulness, uh, amazing human capital, a great deal of financial capital, notwithstanding the sovereign debt situation, a great deal of ingenuity. Japan has a history of overcoming serious uh, challenge, uh, overcoming serious devastation not only from World War II, but as we've seen most recently, uh, almost a year ago, from the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami of March 11, 2011. Uh, Japan is a country that knows how to deal with challenges, and Japan is dealing with the challenges that we here in Canada and elsewhere will be dealing with very shortly. So this is a particularly good time for us to be paying more, not less, attention to Japan. So the Japan Futures Initiative is a network of scholars and practitioners um, open to anyone anywhere, largely at the moment, because we're new, here in Canada and in Japan. Uh, the purpose of which is to help uh, synergize collective study of Japan from a policy relevant social scientific perspective. And today is the beginning of our first, what we hope will be an annual, annual symposium, uh, to look at various challenges that Japan is facing and to see how we, as a, a larger community, might learn from them. The topic of this year's symposium is Disaster Management, Energy Security, and Multilateral Cooperation, the Tohoku Disaster, and its Regional and Global Implications. And that will be the focused study of the uh, uh, symposium all day tomorrow. But to begin us uh, tonight, we have a somewhat more uplifting theme. We're very pleased to welcome as our keynote speaker, Professor John Curtin from the University of Toronto, who's the director of the G8 research group and the co-director of the G20 research group at the Monk School for Global Affairs. And uh, a prolific author, and I think I'm, I'm on safe ground saying, um, recognized worldwide as the world's uh, first authority on the G8. G20 and global governance uh, related to those, those forms of symmetry. Uh, the G8 research group, for those who do not know, is the de facto secretariat of the G8. Uh, 
G8 research group, research group tracks the, the commitments of G8 countries year after year, uh, monitors their compliance to the commitments and acts as a repository of information about any and all aspects of G8 symmetry. And Professor Curtin has been uh, quarterbacking this effort now for many, many years and knows more about it than any other human alive. John is going to speak tonight to us about Japan's contribution to global governance. And when we, when we advertised this keynote lecture, that was the title I understood that he wanted to use. Uh, a little bit later, he came back to me and said, I'd prefer to talk about Japan's leadership in global governance. And I said, by all means, please do that. Leadership is certainly a form of contribution. Um, so please join me in welcoming Professor John Curtin to the podium. Uh, and for those of you who are Web, watching via webcast, we will uh, ask you please to think about questions and indicate via the chat function on the webcast. Uh, questions you might have for Professor Curtin, he would be more than happy to answer them when he has uh, given his presentation, and we look forward to that opportunity. John. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, arigato gozaimasu. Uh, for those kind words, um, for your important role in um, bringing together and inaugurating uh, this important event. But I think more broadly, uh, for those of us of a particular generation who have long been uh, studying Japan, uh, for taking the uh, leadership in the initiative to uh, really uh, unleash a new generation of scholarly thinking um, on Japan and its role um, in the world, uh, both in Canada, but with uh, so many distinguished uh, colleagues uh, from Japan um, itself. Thank you also uh, for the sponsors uh, of this event. Uh, and if uh, I single out one uh, on a personal note, I'm sure you'll uh, forgive me, um, David DeWitt, uh, a career-long um, colleague. Um, so thank you for uh, your support, David, and for flying back uh, from Washington. Uh, to identify and correct uh, any errors uh, I may um, make, uh, as you've been doing uh, as a good colleague uh, for the past um, several decades, uh, I might reveal. Uh, it's a great honor, uh, especially in the company of um, such distinguished uh, authorities, to uh, launch our um, look uh, at um, Japan. Uh, Japan during its um, time of troubles uh, right now uh, but Japan uh, in a global context uh, and how the two come together uh, at the moment uh, and as we look um, forward um, to uh, the future of Japan um, in the world. I think uh, it's important to uh, start uh, with the uh, time of troubles um, because at first glance uh, over the past year uh, and indeed for the two decades before uh, Japan has had a, um, a truly tough time, uh, which I know uh, many are uh, all too familiar with, uh, but it's important, I think, to uh, identify specifically uh, the many challenges uh, that seem to confront um, Japan uh, and its friends um, at this time. Uh, the first, of course, um, the great disaster of March um, 13th um, last year. Not just a natural disaster, we've had those before, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. Not just um, a nuclear disaster, uh, as those other two um, were, uh, but it was as if um, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island uh, had been combined with the Great Asian Tsunami uh, and then produced um, a major uh, economic um, disaster for Japan as well. So it was a triple disaster uh, all in one time, uh, in one place. And I think that's uh, an unprecedented um, shock and an unprecedented um, challenge for global governance as a whole. The shocks, of course, uh, hit a Japan whose um, GDP had contracted last year, uh, contracted um, last quarter, uh, and is still uh, even below uh, its peak economic performance before Lehman went down on September uh, 15th of 2008. It also compounded the problem of uh, Japan's soaring fiscal deficit. 7.6% of uh, GDP um, this year. Uh, but within that, 
um, what uh, the triple disaster brought uh, was a um, newly severe structural deficit uh, as the atomic power stations went uh, offline, as supply chains um, were disrupted, and as uh, massive new monies were required for immediate disaster relief, and then for the reconstruction effort that goes on now. Japan's public debt, uh, compounded by this spending, already uh, it's number one uh, in the world uh, at 236% of GDP. Uh, and that at a time, of course, when because of the Euro crisis, markets and many others are uh, sensitive to the aggregate debt burdens um, that a country bears. Not surprisingly, um, one of the uh, rating agencies in Japan last December um, downgraded uh, Japan's um, score, all wondering if Japan could continue um, to service the debt as well as it had um, for many long years. Japan's export dependent economy hurt by a soaring yen, perversely, but behind that lies uh, an undervaluated uh, Chinese yuan next door tied to a dropping U.S. dollar uh, as well. Uh, a big hit uh, for the export dependent uh, economy that Japan has long had. Japan's trade deficit has just reappeared after an absence of 31 years, largely uh, because of the impact of Fukushima. Uh, before Fukushima, Japan relied on nuclear energy for about 29% of its electricity. It was going to go to uh, 50% by 2030 for all the good reasons. Uh, but now with most of the reactors um, offline, it's had to massively import fossil fuel um, from abroad. Uh, and in fact, its utilities uh, demand for oil imports uh, have increased by a factor of four just over um, the last year, with of course implications for energy prices for Americans filling up at the pump and uh, many other people um, in the world. Japan's population size, um, what we know, um, is shrinking. Uh, fewer uh, Japanese citizens to bear the uh, financial burden. Its population is um, aging very uh, quickly, already number one um, in the OECD, but quite predictably, as the population um, ages, uh, they turn from uh, that phenomenal savings rate, 16%, which Japan um, produced about 20 years ago, uh, which would finance within Japan those great government deficits uh, and debt, it's now dropped to uh, about 2%, forcing Japan, um, looking forward, depend on uh, international markets uh, to cover uh, the deficits um, and debt. Politically, of course, uh, we've had um, revolving door prime ministers, average tenure in office um, about one year, um, no more. Uh, very different days uh, from uh, those of Nakasone-san and Koizumi-san, um, and one wonders uh, when it will end, or even if there's um, more to come. Perhaps both of the old line parties, uh, many fear, uh, will soon be um, blown away uh, by a new regionally based uh, party uh, out of Osaka um, with new but um, still untested ideas on a national scale. Last year, of course, um, China surpassed Japan as the number two most powerful um, country in the world by the conventional uh, measures. Uh, and Japan's um, Asian neighbors uh, continue to produce a very real uh, political um, and security um, threats. China, yes, uh, but of course, a, uh, already nuclear armed North Korea, too. So that, I think, is the um, big tale um, of woe, and it is a very tall tale. But um, let me suggest um, that it's not the whole story of Japan's position, power, and place in the world. And let me argue more provocatively uh, that it's not even uh, the most important part of the story about today's Japan. Because I think if one looks at the record, uh, one will see that 
amidst all of these uh, unprecedented um, challenges, Japan's involvement, Japan's influence in global governance have grown and grown into the realm uh, where we can move from just a contribution, but speak uh, with hard evidence of Japan's leadership in global governance in our 21st century world. What I think we see is that Japan's influence is meeting this high standard in what many acknowledge as probably the two centers of global governance in the modern world. The somewhat old but still continuing uh, group of eight uh, in charge of um, security um, and development and the new um, group of 20 allocated the task of um, financial and economic governance. A newer group uh, created at the level of finance ministers and central bank governors in 1999, but of course one that um, leapt to the leader's uh, level uh, soon after uh, Lehman Brothers went down uh, in the autumn of 2008. If you look at actually what Japan's position is, what its performance has been in those two centers of global governance, yes, you will see that sometimes Japan acts as a loyal American ally. Many other members of those groups do. Sometimes Japan is a uh, mediating bridge builder, often between Asia uh, and America or the Atlantic, uh, but other countries uh, play that role uh, in the G20 um, above all. Uh, but beyond that, the primary uh, pattern, I think, is a Japan that actually leads the G8 and the G20 in producing the global governance that Japan prefers and that uh, many of its closest partners, uh, including Canada, do as well. We start, of course, um, by playing defense, as is often the case uh, in international politics. Uh, what we can see is that um, the G8 and the G20 has given Japan enhanced access to its great American ally. FaceTime uh, with the president, an important asset um, for pretty much every country in the world. Japan has also been able to um, secure exemptions for its exceptional needs and has been also able to join with others to veto bad ideas even when they're backed by Team Europe with the support of the United States. But beyond that, um, offensively, uh, and here's where we move uh, from contribution defensively to offensive leadership in shaping the global governance uh, of today, Japan has been an Asian advocate. It's not just there for itself, but for all of a rising Asia. It's been there uh, as a leader uh, in reforming the old multilateral institutions, above all, the International Monetary Fund, designed in 1944, in order to give the rapidly rising emergencing powers, above all in Asia, the voice, the vote, um, as it's known, that their uh, resources now show that they richly deserve. Japan has also uh, been there to provide global public goods, providing money more than its fair share uh, to help the world get through the great challenges, above all um, the greatest recession since the Great Depression of the 30s uh, that we saw uh, in 2008 and 2009. And also I think slowly, uh, often quietly but cumulatively, shaping a new world order more in the image of Japan and of course um, on behalf of the values uh, that Japan has pioneered at home and that the rest of the world uh, increasingly understand it needs everywhere. This 
basic view of Japan's performance uh, in the G8 uh, and G20, um, I must say at the start, is not the prevailing portrait um, that most of my colleagues who look at these things uh, would offer um, to you. In a conventional view, um, Japan faces, uh, as do other countries uh, and the global community, a truly painful choice. A painful choice, it's usually framed between an old, dying, um, 20th century um, G8 uh, and a new, um, rising um, 21st century G20. And Japan, poor Japan, it is said, has made the wrong choice to hang in there um, with the old declining 20th century G8 uh, at the expense of embracing uh, and leading the new 21st century G20. The evidence shows me uh, that that is um, simply uh, incorrect. Uh, there is no choice, or there is a choice what Japan in practice has done uh, as have several other smart countries, they have chosen both the G8 and the G22. And in the case of um, Japan, uh, we can see its um, leadership in both of the G8 and the G20 groups. Let's start with the G8, because it's been around uh, a long time. Uh, and uh, if you think of the G8 versus the G20, if there's a choice to be made, you can understand why people think that Japan uh, would prefer the G8, as uh, in fact um, Japan is probably the most loyal country to that um, proven group. Canada, uh, maybe Russia come a close second, uh, but Japan clearly here uh, is uh, number one. When the Proto-G8 started, um, the first summit, um, back in the summer of 1975, it was a group of only uh, four leaders uh, meeting in the British Embassy in Helsinki on the margins of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. And that tells uh, much about where the center of global governance, at least geographically, was uh, back then and indeed continuously uh, since the world of 1944-45. Japan just wasn't there. But a few months later when the first real G7 summit was held at Rambouillet, France, November uh, 1975, Japan was a full equal member from the first moment. A status it didn't have then in the United Nations Security Council a status it doesn't have to this day in that center of UN governance. So you compare the two global institutions that do global peace and security, you could see why um, Japan uh, would like to uh, be acknowledged as of 1975 and now as one of the uh, leading powers of the world to contribute to global security governance uh, in its own um, particular uh, way. At that first summit at Rambouillet, um, Japan uh, was, of course, um, the only Asian representative. If you go to uh, the United Nations Security Council, of course, uh, China um, has that um, slot. It was Japan that suggested that this new center of global governance actually tell the world on um, transparency what its core purpose was what all of the members um, were committed to. And thus, because of Japan, we got at the opening of the communique of that first summit, the charter equivalent for an informal uh, institution, a declaration uh, that these countries had not rights, but responsibilities, and responsibilities to protect within themselves, but to promote globally the specific values of open democracy, individual liberty, and social advance. And although this wasn't said uh, to do so, if necessary, by intervening in the internal affairs of sovereign states to get that democratization job done. So if you think that 
democratization is more of a prevailing reality in the global community now than one. Um, you can say that uh, the G8 um, has been on the right side of history, uh, and Japan, of course, um, at the core uh, of the attempt to do um, what we might call uh, right rule. We can look um, over the long 37 plus years of um, G8 summitry uh, in the first instance at the summits Japan actually um, hosted uh, to see the difference um, Japan made because uh, in G8 summitry as in other summitries, uh, the host uh, has um, an increasing um, ability to shape the agenda uh, to um, nudge the outcomes uh, towards the agreements uh, that it prefers. The first summit Japan hosted was in 1979 in Tokyo. You can take your mind back uh, to the world of 1979. Iran was a very big problem. Uh, gas prices at the pumps in the United States uh, were soaring. Um, some of the same problems uh, we're confronting uh, right now. But at the 1979 summit, Japan got its G7 countries um, to stop the second oil shock. The first had been in 1973. And not just to beat that clear and present danger of the moment, but to stop the world from being afflicted by oil shocks of similar scale and scope uh, and severity ever since. Uh, so what we are um, seeing at the moment is but a mere miniature reflect. Moreover, uh, and as part of that, the 1979 summit invented for the world the global governance for control of climate change. And it did so by putting in place the most ambitious control regime and the most effective control regime that the world has seen ever since. So if climate change matters uh, as an integral part of uh, energy security, and if you need to govern both together, that was done um, with enormous uh, ambition and effectiveness at the first summit Japan hosted in 1979. At that summit, Japan showed its instinct to be more inclusive, to bring more Asians into that emerging center of um, global governance. Its choice at the time uh, was its geographical uh, Asian neighbor, uh, Australia, but it couldn't convince the other members of the club uh, that Australia uh, deserved um, a spot. Uh, it's different, of course, um, in the G20. 1986, um, Tokyo 2. Uh, we remember it for another form of um, outreach. Uh, until then, global financial governance uh, had been uh, held by the old G5. Yes, Japan was there, um, but Tokyo and Canada were not. But at Tokyo 1986, the club was expanded. So Canada and Italy um, got into um, that club. 1986 uh, was also the summit that launched the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations. The G7 had tried to do that the year before uh, in Bonn. They failed, but in doing so, they almost destroyed the G7 summit. Japan got the job done. And of course, at the uh, subsequent uh, Japanese hosted summit in 1993, Tokyo uh, 3, that summit did the market access deal that broke the logjam that meant that the world at the GATT, successfully concluded the Uruguay round. That might seem like distant history, but compare it uh, with how things have been going uh, with the launch and uh, non-conclusion of today's Doha development round started in 2001, but undone now. 2000 um, Okinawa. Uh, Japan um, gave birth to the Global Fund against HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. It took a giant leap forward uh, in bringing civil society in uh, to um, G8 governance. And it tried, uh, but failed, uh, to invite some of its uh, fellow Asian leaders to participate 
in what was now the G8 summit uh, with Russia on board. China was one of those um, countries. Couldn't quite pull it off then. Uh, but it did manage to uh, bring to Tokyo the heads of some of the world's major multilateral organizations, the head of the World Health Organization, of course, individuals who properly claim to represent the global community uh, as a whole. 2008, Toyako uh, Hokkaido. Uh, Japan secured a consensus uh, from the G8 for a new approach to climate change control after it was pretty clear uh, that uh, the Kyoto formula um, wasn't going to do the job. It was a new sectoral bottom-up approach, which meant that all carbon-producing powers could and should control their carbon, not just a small group uh, of 34, uh, as the Kyoto Protocol um, had said. Moreover, uh, on expansiveness and inclusion in global governance, uh, Japan held as an integral part of the Toyako Hokkaido Summit for the climate change discussion, which were a centerpiece, not just a chat amongst the eight uh, or the nine or uh, the 10 with the European Union there, uh, but 17 countries uh, from a new uh, major economies um, meeting uh, and forum, including China, including uh, many of um, the countries that um, we would recognize as the members of um, today's um, G20. Uh, but of course, uh, Toyako Hokkaido uh, was also the place where a small group of countries, uh, the leaders of the um, BRICS, met by themselves on the um, sideline. So uh, there is um, an alternative for some countries in the great global game of um, centers of global governance. Uh, one of the reasons, I think, uh, why Japan and others uh, would prefer both the G8 um, and the G20 uh, because um, uh, the BRICS uh, is there now, uh, but many of those countries uh, are not there um, in that. Japan, of course, uh, enjoyed many successes at other um, G8 um, summits. Um, but in the broader um, G8 system, I think uh, we should recall um, two uh, defining facts. Japan, from the start, has been a member of all of the um, G7, G8 um, institutions. Uh, the latest edition, uh, Russia, an earlier edition of the European Union is not. Um, so Japan is, um, if you will, uh, the most permanent member of the entire um, G8 um, system. And on some of the um, new bodies, uh, the Global Health Security Initiative, uh, some of the older ones, uh, the trade ministers, a quadrilateral, and of course the good old G7 finance ministers, there when a global financial crisis hits, uh, you can count on uh, Japan and um, a small group of others to be there uh, as the first responders uh, in truly crisis-ridden times. What about the um, G20? Uh, the story of G20 governance is really framed by two great global financial crises. Uh, the one which still rings with great imminence uh, in the minds of uh, all Asians is the Asian-turned-global financial crisis that began in the summer of uh, 1997 in Thailand and then uh, went global um, over the next two years, uh, consuming in turn, taking down Indonesia, Korea, Russia itself um, in August uh, 1998 then almost the United States uh, with the death of uh, long-term capital um, management, and then Brazil, uh, and uh, in a year or two later, Argentina and Turkey uh, as well. A global financial crisis, if one by today's standards, unfolded in slow motion. Nonetheless, it was enough um, to lead two particular individuals, Larry Summers of the United States, uh, Paul Martin of Canada, to, to invent a, a new group to confront um, such crises should they recur, as they were almost certain to, it was understood, and to prevent them uh, and contain them uh, as best they could. Hence, um, the G20. You look at the uh, origins of the G20, of course, everybody assumed that um, Japan would um, be a member 
Uh, but Japan didn't say, oh, um, you know, we um, want to be uh, the only um, Asian representative. Uh, Japan actually welcomed uh, the emergence of the uh, G20 because it was a much more Asian club uh, than just the um, old um, G8. Uh, look at the arithmetic. The G20, which only has 19 countries, actually has five Asian members, Japan, China, Korea, Indonesia, and Australia. That's about 25%. Um, the um, G8 uh, just had one, uh, if you say Russia is um, almost um, everything. So the G20 was a um, great leap forward for uh, all of Asia, uh, and that's the kind of global governance forum that Japan thought uh, the world um, needed uh, now. Uh, Japan, of course, um, uh, on the uh, difficult decisions about who would be a member, not everybody was um, in favor of uh, bringing Saudi Arabia in. Uh, the G8, of course, uh, is an all-democratic club. Um, uh, how would you um, cope if you had more diversity um, in the um, G20? China had to be there, yes, but Saudi Arabia. Uh, Japan, of course, um, as a matter of uh, rational calculation, uh, with some hint of uh, inclusiveness, wanted Saudi Arabia in. An energy dependent um, Japan, Saudi Arabia um, with a lot, um, but some sense that a new club could bring together that diversity, have a conversation across the diversity, um, socialize countries uh, into a uh, new multicultural um, world. An outward um, looking Japan uh, we can see signs of uh, at the beginning um, back then. What have Japan's achievements uh, been uh, in G20 governance, um, particularly um, when it leapt to the uh, leaders level, um, to the summit um, level back in um, 2008? Could have done it a few years uh, earlier. Prescience, prevention in global governance. Um, Paul Martin had the vision, uh, as many um, here know. Uh, wanted to hold um, the G20 at the leaders' uh, level and almost pulled it off uh, in 2005. Prime Minister uh, Kuzumi uh, was convinced in the end of the merits. Said, okay, I'll come to the first, and if it works, I'll go to the next one and everyone since. Uh, the only uh, holdout uh, amongst the um, 20 uh, was the President of the United States. Um, George W. Um, Bush. But it was George Bush who, uh, by the autumn of um, 2008, after Lehman and AIG and so other, many other pillars of American capital some died, knew he needed to respond not by himself, but with um, a global governance group uh, of his friends. And um, once he thought about it, not just the good old um, G8, maybe with a few others added, but the tried and true and proven um, G20 itself. And of course, um, that was Japan's choice, uh, as it was um, every other member uh, of the established um, G20. So what has Japan um, done uh, in it? Um, uh, the first, and we'll begin uh, modestly, uh, G20 symmetry uh, has given Japan much enhanced access to its special American ally, FaceTime um, with the president. Yes, at all of the uh, G20 summits themselves, they started off having two a year in addition to the G8 ones. But at the uh, many more finance ministers uh, meetings that have been held, not just one a year anymore, uh, but more, uh, the preparatory uh, meetings for these summits, but at other ministerial meetings too, um, finance, but now G20 governance is spread to agriculture ministers, labor, development, um, foreign affairs, uh, and even a meeting of tourism uh, ministers uh, is about to uh, uh, arise. That's important um, for Japan who, uh, with its uh, revolving door of uh, prime ministers, has found it increasingly difficult to get standalone bilateral um, FaceTime uh, with the president to continue a tradition of old of uh, the first meetings, uh, right? Uh, 
And you can see why a uh, president of the United States uh, tends to say, well, pretty busy. How much time should I invest in you know, developing a, a real relationship with the president of Japan who might not be there um, next um, year? So that kind of face time with the president, access into uh, the American administration has been increasingly uh, and importantly uh, delivered by G20 governance. Secondly, uh, Japan has been able to um, secure exemptions for its exceptional needs. One of the great highlights of G20 governance uh, was the historic Toronto G20 summit um, in the summer of 2010. Not all of my fellow Torontonians remember it that way. Uh, but it had to confront um, the first installment of the great European crisis, Greece won. And to do it, it had to convince skitterish markets um, that uh, all of the key countries would control their soaring deficits and accumulated government um, debt. So they all pledged the advanced members of the group that they would cut their deficits in half as a percentage of GDP by 2013, and by 2016, stop the rise in their accumulated government deficit debt uh, as a percentage of GDP. But from the start, they gave Japan an exemption because they simply knew it was in a special situation and, of course, um, couldn't do it. Not that they anticipated um, the shocks of um, 2011, um, but they uh, knew enough um, to give Japan uh, the breathing space um, that it needed um, then. Japan has also been able to join with others uh, to veto bad ideas um, in G20 governance. Uh, there's a fairly long list, um, but uh, one of the key examples is an early idea of the Europeans, supported in the end by the Americans, that we should slap a global levy on the big banks, presumably to uh, punish them for their misdeeds uh, in creating the financial crisis or to raise more money, uh, which um, all of the uh, governments um, in the advanced countries uh, were in desperately um, need of. Japan thought this was a very bad idea. Um, so did Canada. So did every other member of the G20. If you had to uh, decide that uh, within the uh, good old G7, just look at the numbers. All the Europeans and the United States up against polite Japanese uh, and the Canadians, uh, I think the Canadian-Japanese position would probably have lost. But in the G20, every other uh, member that wasn't a member of the uh, G7 backed Canada, backed Japan, and the idea of a, a big bank levy um, died. Uh, and then in the little reprise uh, we saw most recently at the uh, French-hosted Cannes Summit in November, it took the form of a, a global international financial transaction task, and same numbers, same outcome, uh, that idea um, had died as well. Why, it's not just um, about the um, banks, uh, although a rich dialogue uh, can be held there. But it points to, I think, um, an important point about the G20 and how it's different um, than the old G8. It is not just the same club of major powers uh, with more um, numbers um, inside. Uh, to be a member of the G8, you have to be a major power and a democratic one, or at least a democratically uh, committed one. Uh, and the Russian story um, still goes on. But to be a member of the G20 in a rational um, but prescient recognition of the new world you have to be systemically significant. And you can be systemically significant as a country in two ways. The first one, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, um, Korea, is um, you're so connected with the rest of the world that if you go down, you'll take everybody else with it. You're a consumer of financial security uh, in the discourse uh, of a distant age. Or you can be systemically significant by being a provider of financial security riding to the rescue uh, when other countries go down and uh, threaten to take the whole system because of the connectivity along with them as well. Look at the two financial crises. Um, think of the um, numbers. 
the consumers of financial security um, in the Asian turned global financial crisis are, I think, all now of the providers of financial security in the American or Atlantic turned global financial crisis of 2008 to now. There's actually only a handful of countries that were not consumers of financial security either in the first crisis or in the one um, we're still in, but providers of financial security um, both times. And Japan, of course, is one of those um, that showed that extraordinary resilience in global financial governance because of its real financial resources um, a decade ago uh, and to this day. We also see um, Japan's success uh, in uh, reforming the International um, Monetary Fund, changing the rules of the game uh, that were created in that very Eurocentric world of 1944. And this is hard politics, so this is the uh, ultimate um, zero-sum game. Because every share uh, of the real power uh, on the IMF executive board, the quota of voice and vote, um, that I get, if I'm a rising power and deserve it, has to be given up by somebody else of the declining powers that simply uh, aren't as big uh, as they were in um, 1945. For those of you who uh, believe um, in the autonomous impact of international um, institutions, the IMF tried repeatedly uh, to reform itself on voice and vote reform. It failed. The G7 tried to reform IMF voice and vote reform, most notably at the uh, Halifax summit in 1995. It failed. Then the G20 tried, and it succeeded. In the first stage at the ministerial level um, in 2005, uh, but above all uh, at the leaders level uh, at the Seoul summit in November um, 2001. So in one of the toughest nuts to crack in the whole institutional, indeed constitutional structure of global governance, the G20 came through. And Japan was actually always in the lead of doing that reform along with its fellow rising uh, Asian states because the formula had become so obsolete that Japan was actually one of the rising powers in this particular um, game. There is, of course, um, one outstanding um, footnote uh, that were, is worthy of uh, mention. Uh, the G20 also agreed uh, that henceforth um, the head, the executive head of the IMF uh, and the World Bank uh, would be chosen uh, on the basis of global merit from the global pool of candidates uh, rather than simply on the basis of um, nationality uh, as defined um, in a dirty deal uh, in the uh, 1940s. Uh, that, I think, is uh, one of the commitments um, that has not yet been um, complied with, uh, but we'll watch how the process of selecting uh, a new executive head for the World Bank um, unfolds. Japan is a, a provider of um, global public goods. Uh, much can be said here, uh, but let's go to um, the moment the um, crisis um, hits. Lehman goes down. September 15th, uh, 2008. Who's the first responder? Oh, well, in this case, it was the G7. Other uh, central um, bankers flooding the world with um, liquidity. But it was basically um, the big four um, central uh, banks, uh, the Fed, uh, the ECB, uh, the Bank of England, and of course, the Bank of um, Japan. Yes, Canada and the Swiss and uh, the Chinese came in in a second tranche to uh, contribute. But it was the big four. Uh, liquidity solves your immediate problem, but then, as good Keynesians, you need uh, real fiscal um, support. Japan was the first to offer $100 billion in the form of a loan, yes, but to the IMF. And at the end of the day, uh, when all the uh, pledges uh, were counted, who bore the burden? Japan, $100 billion. The USA, $100 um, billion, too. I didn't grow up in a world where the relative capability of the United States was the same as Japan. The Europeans, all of Team Europe, the largest marketplace in the world, uh, they put in a um, 100 billion um, too. 
of the Chinese, um, 40 billion um, in the end. So you just do the raw arithmetic, who bore more than their fair share of the burden? And from the start uh, through to the end, uh, the answer is clearly um, Japan. We can look um, elsewhere at um, Japan's role um, in global um, governance to see um, how the very rules uh, of the game are changing. Uh, and here, um, one of the things we look for is the contribution, uh, not just in financial resources, um, but in institutional initiative. After the first Washington um, summit, Japan offered to host the second G20 summit, uh, and then the third, um, but um, quickly understood that it was better um, for the global community if the second one was hosted by Gordon Brown's um, Britain, and the third one, which took place in uh, Pittsburgh, was actually hosted by the new president of the United States, Barack Obama, right? Let's lock him into uh, the game. After that, Japan had a choice. It could have bid to host the next one, but no. Its democratic neighbor from Asia wanted to do it. That was Korea. Uh, so Japan backed um, Korea, showing its um, expansive um, Asian um, solidarity, um, I think. So we haven't yet seen a Japan host um, a G20 um, summit. It's not because um, they're not into the game. I think it's uh, because of some pretty sophisticated uh, foreign policy calculations um, on their part. Whenever one talks about symmetry, uh, the question always arises uh, when these politicians come together and uh, make these uh, promises. Uh, then they go home. Uh, do they keep the promises uh, when they're back um, home alone? Uh, as David uh, mentioned, we've spent a fair bit of time um, looking at precisely um, that. And I think the answer is uh, pretty clear. Um, in both the G8 uh, and the G20, promises kept are, on the whole, promises made. Uh, Japan keeps its promises in the G8 um, close to the average, but a little less uh, than the other members um, do. Uh, but in the G20, Japan's compliance record is significantly above the average um, for the um, G20. Further evidence, I think, that Japan is actually bearing uh, more than its fair um, share of the burden, not only in making uh, paper promises, but in actually uh, making the change back at home to get the uh, collective commitments uh, put into effect um, in the real world. Let me end by um, looking um, most broadly um, at global governance from my de facto starting point uh, in 1944, uh, 1945 um, to now. I think we can see that there have been three um, great leaps forward um, in global governance uh, since uh, the first time. Uh, the first came um, beyond Bretton Woods uh, a year later in the United Nations um, in 1945. And while we all love um, the United Nations, uh, all Canadians and Japan, as I think scholars of global governance, uh, the following can be uh, accurately said. In the UN in 1945, uh, an American-occupied Japan had no role in shaping the global governance uh, of the charter um, that arose. After all, it was a, a defeated, devastated victim of the world's first use of nuclear weapons. It wasn't the charter of then and now, uh, labeled, it's pretty clear, an enemy, alien, aggressor state. In a charter that uh, prohibited international interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states. A charter that did not even recognize the existence of the uh, natural um, environment, uh, let alone uh, its value. A charter that excluded Japan from the Security Council Permanent Five, where the only representative from Asia was um, China, uh, but where all the members quickly became nuclear weapons states. In part, I think, have remained nuclear weapons states in order to um, support their status within um, the P5. Japan? Well, long the second, um, now the third uh, most powerful country in the world, uh, ruthlessly um, anti-nuclear weapons state, 
frozen out of that center of global security government. And in Japan, um, that uh, has been an environmental pioneer uh, in global governance, also um, not in at the UN's global governance core. Flash forward to 1975 to the birth of the G7. Japan was a fully equal founding member. It was the only Asian member of a group that contained as equal members four non-nuclear countries and only three nuclear weapons wants. What kind of balance do you want for global um, security uh, governance? The UNSC P5 uh, or um, the G7 um, one. A G7 that in that informal charter, the first communique, identified environmental values, conservation, just one word, um, but at least it was um, there, that dedicated itself um, to, as I mentioned, spread of um, open democracy, individual liberty, um, by implicitly, uh, but in reality interfering in the internal affairs of sovereign states. Uh, the RP2 um, institution uh, before the world um, had invented um, the phrase. Uh, Japan, of course, um, that uh, in the G8 helped it um, stop the oil shocks, invent climate change governance, that actually secured um, G7 recognition uh, at one summit uh, for um, a just um, resolution of the uh, Northern Territories uh, problem that um, Japan had uh, with its neighbor, um, Russia. And um, perhaps um, most um, recently, in the days following um, Fukushima, when we saw not the magic of the marketplace, but the mania of the uh, marketplace, uh, with the yen soaring to historic highs, further damaging uh, Japan's um, export-dependent uh, economy, it was the G7 that was there uh, within days with the first coordinated exchange rate uh, intervention in a decade in order to bring uh, the value of the Japanese yen down. Finally then, um, the G20 at 1999. Japan is a full, enthusiastic founding member in a club that finally contained um, more Asian members uh, than European um, ones. Uh, Japan um, still scarred uh, from the haunting memories of the Asian financial um, crisis, eager um, to make the G20 um, work uh, to bring, if you remember its core mission, financial stability to the world, but also, thanks to Paul Martin, making globalization work for the benefit of all. A G20 that delivered uh, the IMF voice and vote reform that gives Japan and other um, emerging and Asian powers um, the uh, voice they deserve. And then, of course, um, stopped uh, the great plunge uh, into um, the world's worst um, recession since the 1930s. And as, of course, um, the leaders of the G20 uh, were in um, free fall. They thought not just of um, the Great Depression, but they thought of um, what it would bring and what it could bring um, again. Hitler uh, and the Holocaust um, were on the minds of uh, many uh, with long memories of that dark age. So with such a uh, record of um, achievement, uh, I think we can understand um, why Japan has chosen both the good old um, G8 uh, and the uh, new G20. We can also, I think, um, see how Japan's colleagues in the G20 and Japan itself, who uh, would know and understand um, of its um, repeated leadership in G8 uh, and G20 governance, uh, would see it uh, as a way uh, in which Japan can still shape, uh, despite the current time of troubles, uh, the kind of world order um, that it and its closest partners um, prefer. Uh, so with that, um, let me um, turn it over um, to see uh, what uh, the conversation will yield. Thank you very much, John, for that, uh, to mix metaphors, that grand tour de force. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate it.
And we are open for questions uh, from both the audience here and the audience on the web. And I'll begin with an, a question from the web, relayed to me by the miracle of the modern BlackBerry. With its declining population and the rise of China, what can Japan do to remain a crucial cog in the wheel of global governance? Well, um, when we um, look at um, the two G groups, um, of course, um, uh, we think of the uh, member of the uh, good old uh, G7, G8, um, with the smallest population from the start, uh, that's Canada. And if Canada um, can maintain its status as a full member, or for reasons um, other than the politeness of its colleagues, but a hard contribution, and use it to um, shape global governance um, too, uh, a Japan whose population I think will shrink from about 127 million uh, now to an estimated um, 90 uh, million or so a uh, few decades hence. That's no reason to think uh, that a country that's still um, three times as populous um, as Canada, still larger uh, than any of the uh, European ones of the day who are also um, downsizing, uh, that could well actually be larger in population than the Russian um, Federation, um, right? And that in a broader um, G20, uh, as you look out a few decades, we'll see a shrinking China uh, and in India a few decades. So we're all um, aging, uh, right? Um, so in the raw numbers, um, it's not a problem. Uh, and um, Japan may in fact have um, first mover um, advantage. Uh, aging um, of the population uh, was an issue that actually came on to uh, the G20 agenda at the finance um, minister's um, level uh, in one of the first um, ministerial meetings um, hosted uh, in Asia, uh, brought to you um, by the um, Australians of all um, people. Um, Australia, of course, has a, actually a rising population. Uh, and a, a non-aging uh, one, um, so you just have to assume that they were uh, looking outwards to the issues uh, or problems of their neighbors um, next door. Uh, so in uh, macro terms, um, not um, problem, in more specialized um, terms, uh, one can uh, point to um, a few things. Uh, one is the strong emphasis on uh, human capital uh, and uh, modern education. Uh, and uh, indeed uh, internet connectivity um, as the uh, drivers of our real economic growth in the future. And there are um, many ways uh, in which Japan uh, can claim leadership in segments of those, uh, although we all tend to think of the um, obstacles um, it uh, faces. Uh, there are others, uh, and here I must say, um, let me highlight um, one. Uh, where both of the G groups um, have struggled uh, and largely um, failed. Uh, in two words, it's um, gender um, equality. Um, the uh, G8 has actually made some uh, small progress uh, of um, late, um, particularly in the uh, G8 uh, Africa um, action um, plan uh, because of um, at least one of the members uh, of the G8 uh, making sure the gender equality uh, value and its implications uh, were there. Uh, it was not something that the Africans themselves um, asked for. It'll be a tougher um, haul in the uh, G20, uh, which is why it's uh, not really uh, there now. If you do have um, Saudi Arabia um, as a member, um, right, um, and perhaps uh, some other um, countries with large um, Islamic um, populations or other um, faith groups, it's uh, tough to get a consensus of how to uh, move forward. Uh, on um, that. Um, but um, despite those um, obstacles, uh, I think um, on the whole, um, we can see uh, with the great intensity of um, G20 um, governance, certainly the institutional forums, uh, where new ideas, um, innovative growth, um, green growth um, can get um, on the uh, table um, some of those areas in which Japan has been a pioneer. On balance, uh, has Japan's constitutional and domestic political limitations on its international security role been an asset or a liability? It's a big judgment. If you think that the uh, future of global security governance um, in the 21st century is one that will um, be um, given or guaranteed um, by the classic formula um, many of my age grew up with, 
uh, nuclear weapons, uh, which deter um, the use of nuclear weapons um, by other Westphalian um, sovereign um, states, then you can have a um, rich debate. Uh, but if you think the world has changed, uh, to quote the Wizard of Oz, uh, I don't think we're living in Westphalia of 1648 um, any um, more. Uh, it's a world uh, not of static sovereigns uh, playing the old game. It's increasingly a world of uh, intense interconnectivity that the G20 recognizes, right? That's the whole point about systemic significance. You go down today, I don't say, aha, I'm ahead in the old relative capability game. I go down tomorrow. It's a complex adaptive system. That's what we have to govern. In climate change, we know. Uh, in um, the internet, um, cyberspace on the positive side, cyber espionage on the weak. Global health governance, SARS in Hong Kong one day, Japan the next. A Toronto um, too. So in the field of um, nuclear um, weapons, uh, I think um, there is um, a growing understanding of revealed um, prevalence that um, uh, the fewer um, countries uh, that have um, the bomb uh, or can get it, if only because uh, they might fall into the hands of non-state actors, if Iran gets it, uh, who will get it uh, a year um, from now. Or the horrible um, problems, um, which we haven't quite yet had uh, in the full shock scenario and tend to uh, overlook, inadvertent, accidental, and unauthorized um, launch. That's the um, nuclear problem of the um, 21st um, century. Uh, and the only way to uh, contain it is to stop it um, at um, source. Uh, and there, um, I think, the numbers, the balance, are right uh, in the G20 far more uh, than even in the um, G8, uh, now with Russia in, right? You have uh, an overwhelmingly uh, non-nuclear weapons uh, majority uh, in the G20. But it is a problem um, as follows, uh, and uh, involves an important question uh, that many scholars of um, G20 governance and practitioners um, agonize with uh, all the time. At the Pittsburgh summit in 2009, September, uh, the G20 leaders proudly proclaimed that henceforth they would be the permanent premier um, forum for our members' international economic cooperation. There was much that was good for Japan um, in that. Uh, but the division of labor seemed to be the old G8 would do, as I alluded to, security, you know, Iran's nukes, uh, and development. Uh, and then the G20 would do um, finance um, and economics. But it was always a fiction. Uh, and it was, in fact, um, silly. Because anybody who's done summitry uh, know that um, the one person in the government of Canada or Japan that we pay to worry about all the problems, all the time, uh, together, and try and find win-win-win solutions, that's the leader. So when you get leaders together uh, at a summit, nobody's going to tell them uh, you can't talk about this or that because of this so-called um, division of labor. Uh, there's a particular incident uh, which was revealing in two ways. Um, uh, the first is a matter of process. Uh, the Americans had a terrific idea. They were very committed to it at the Pittsburgh summit um, at Toronto uh, and since. Every other member, including the Japan, um, thought it was a bad idea, so it didn't happen. But substantively, uh, well, in terms of process, this proves that um, the G20 is not an American-dominated or directed or all-led um, club, despite the fact that the American president hosted the first summit um, and the um, third. But in terms of substance, um, I think the Americans were right and everyone else uh, was wrong. The specific issue was this. It had been declared um, by the Financial Action Task Force that Iran actually uh, was engaged in um, money laundering uh, and tax evasion and tax abuse uh, as a non-compliant country. And uh, Leo Brainerd, um, the finance deputy of the United States, said, we should all say in the communique, there is this empirical finding, and name names. Iran, you are guilty. And that would be uh, the justification for imposing more sanctions on a G20-wide basis with China and India in 
as well. Um, but everybody else said, oh no, that looks like political security and uh, we only do uh, finance um, and economics. Um, of course, everyone knew that what the Americans um, had on their minds uh, was sanctioning Iran to stop its nuclear weapons um, program, uh, right? But um, if you go back to um, G20 governance a long time um, ago, uh, from this starting point, um, the third G20 um, ministerial um, meeting. Uh, was supposed to take place in India, didn't. Um, took place uh, in Ottawa. Took place in the autumn of 2011. It's an important uh, moment because um, in the immediate wake of 9-11, um, March 11, no other international institution, old or new, could physically function not the IMF, um, not the G7. The only one that did, thanks to Paul Martin, was the G20. And because there was a G20 meeting um, in Ottawa, other meetings uh, were held um, as part of that. But what, talk about fast moving, uh, flexible, um, what the G20 did had been created only two years ago, you know, to no more Asian financial crises. But it shifted like a laser beam to a deal with terrorist um, finance. And of course, um, imagine the 20 finance ministers around the table. Um, well, Gordon Brown, uh, what do you know about um, Islamic finance and uh, hawalas and, uh, well, not much. Paul, what do you know? Well, you know, American Treasury Secretary, you know, but the people who had the expertise were the people at the uh, lower end of the um, batting order, uh, if you will, uh, you know, Indonesia, Turkey, uh, and yes, Saudi Arabia um, too. So they were all there together uh, in a process of learning about how to govern uh, a completely unforeseen um, event in what was really a complex uh, adaptive um, system uh, where the little ones um, were the teachers. Uh, but they all came together in an extraordinary um, interpersonal bond. If you could do that at the finance minister's level uh, in that um, searing uh, moment of a uh, crisis, why couldn't you just, with that memory, do it a little bit uh, more preventatively at the leader's level and say, yes, well, we get it, uh, right? So maybe we should move a little uh, before Iran or its closest friends in uh, Lebanon or who knows where uh, might move closer um, to getting um, the bombs. So uh, that raises the big question of um, how do you think the uh, G20 um, might um, evolve and I'm on the optimistic side of this class, this half full. When leaders get together, they will be leaders, um, if they're allowed um, to. Uh, and leaders can do anything uh, and should do it um, in those win-win, um, interlinked, creative, uh, and ideally uh, proactive uh, and preventative um, ways. So I think that story is still waiting um, to um, roll um, out. We'll, um, have to um, see, um, but uh, some of the dynamics, uh, I think, from the past, uh, from that 9-11 moment, um, really do show not just what the G20 could be, but what it actually has been um, in the past. Um, would that um, the G20 had been um, impressive as a center of global governance, fast, flexible, fast moving, integrative, in the wake of March 11, 2011, as it was in 9-11 um, here uh, in North America, if I might put it um, that way. But that's an issue we can take up tomorrow. Yeah, I'll take a question from the floor here. Thank you. Uh, Professor Curtin, uh, about Japan's leadership in the G8 and G20, have you observed a difference in Japan's leadership in these institutions since the change in government, since the DPJ took over, so September 2009-ish, has, has Japan's leadership in these institutions changed much since then? I know that's a really small period. Um, and also, if you could comment on the, what do you think these, the domestic challenges Japan faces as a result of, of 311 going forward? What impact will those domestic challenges have on Japan's capacity and willingness to lead in the G8 and the G20? Thanks. On the first question, uh, and it's important um, one, um, on the whole, I do think one of the causes of high performance in G20 governance is um, 
the continuity and the competence um, and the commitment of uh, the actual leaders um, at the table. So Paul Martin is finance minister. Paul Martin is uh, prime minister in the great quest to bring a summit to life. And boy, um, whatever you think uh, about partisan politics in Britain, we were awfully lucky to have Gordon Brown, a veteran as chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, but there uh, as a leader, uh, right? Uh, when the latest um, big crisis um, hit. Look at the Japanese prime minister. Um, you have um, of late um, very little um, continuity uh, indeed, um, when Koizumi-san uh, went to his first um, G8 um, summit, uh, he came back and um, told his uh, Sherpa, I uh, felt as if I was um, naked, um, like a little child. I really, it really does take um, some time to not just, you know, learn um, the personalities, um, the players. And of course, Japan has always had a bit of a, a linguistic um, barrier, right? You just can't crack jokes. Um, the way um, Silvio Berlusconi and uh, George uh, W. Bush could, um, for um, example. Uh, the competence um, also uh, matters. Uh, when Paul Martin was there, um, not only had been he, he been finance minister for a very long time, uh, but had been the uh, CEO of um, a company of um, some global um, involvement. So he didn't need, uh, well, when his bureaucrats um, suggested, well, uh, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing um, or extrapolating all the brilliant um, PhDs in economics from the University of Chicago who now work at uh, IMF say you have to do this. Paul said, well, actually, no. I know enough to know. Uh, no, I don't have to, uh, right? Uh, and that won't, both from the private sector side uh, and from uh, the finance uh, minister um, side. Um, you can extend that uh, out, um, our dear uh, G20 uh, leaders are trying to uh, regulate things as uh, detailed as uh, executive pay. What's a senior executive VP of uh, the Bank of Nova Scotia going to get this year, right? Can you imagine? I mean, the king of Saudi Arabia having a voice um, on that. Or accounting standards, self-governing, professional regulatory um, bodies. Um, why would you want, um, I don't know, Barack Obama, yes, a lawyer, but uh, to tell you uh, what accounting standards you should use? Or the other way around. Um, if uh, part of the problem uh, is uh, accounting standards for Islamic finance, back to 9-11, right? Why would you think that Stephen Harper, uh, even though he came from a family where there were accounts, right, would know anything about that? So the expertise actually, uh, this is the competence, um, does matter. So um, yes, um, earlier Japanese leaders, uh, primarily uh, in G8, they had the continuity uh, advantage, um, Koizumi um, San, right? But there's more packed um, into um, to that, uh, which is why I think, just to uh, extend the point, why the uh, intensification institutionally of G20 governance, where you give more ministers from different portfolios a place, I mean, that's one of the guarantees um, that you're not going to hit the ground on the cold, right? Uh, if you have rotating um, prime ministers, if I could put it that way. It's a problem we've long dealt with um, in Italy um, before uh, Mr. Berlusconi uh, arrived, um, uh, recognizing the uh, ironies uh, in the way I put it um, just um, then. Sorry, the second part of your question was? Uh, it related to the impact of the 311 domestic challenges on Japan's future willingness and capacity to lead at the G and G20. I think it is still um, understandably um, self-absorbed in dealing with the aftermath um, and, of course, um, with this added burden of um, political uncertainty. It's um, very difficult uh, for Prime Minister, um, the Prime Minister of Japan to uh, even uh, plausibly promise um, to uh, launch and then follow up uh, on a, a diplomatic initiative over the next three or um, six months. So. Uh, that meant that has meant that we uh, haven't seen anything uh, real um, yet. What I can say uh, is that um, there is a landing spot, Camp David, the next G8 um, summit, um, designed to be one of the best uh, leaders alone, small, um, intimate, face-to-face, -to -face, tough talk, 
uh, the kind of conversations you have with your spouse. I mean, it really is uh, pretty um, hard to um, hard uh, on the agenda in a big way uh, is energy, energy security. Uh, and as part of the energy security problematic um, is um, nuclear energy. Um, so there's an idea. I don't know if Barack Obama has said, who do you want to lead uh, the discussion on nuclear energy amongst the uh, G8? You do have a choice. Uh, you could ask Angela Merkel, uh, who would give a um, wonderfully convincing, and she's got a lot of authority in the G8, about why we should all get rid of our nuclear power plants, just like Germany uh, is doing um, now, right? Or you could ask um, the president of um, France, right? No, <laughs> let's just keep building uh, ever more. Things are fine, right? Uh, but if you really want somebody who will um, identify the balance, right, the trade-offs or the risks, who better uh, than the prime minister of Japan? So that's um, one opportunity. Uh, the second opportunity is the uh, G20 um, Los Cabos summit coming up in uh, June on Mexico's um, Pacific um, coast. At the moment, um, this category of natural disasters is really not on um, the agenda. Interesting, um, it was at G20 summits uh, in the recent uh, past, uh, the Haitian earthquake, uh, January 12th, um, 2010, um, put it there. Uh, fortuitously, uh, the G20 Sherpas were actually meeting uh, in Mexico City on that uh, day. They heard of the earthquake. Uh, they rushed um, to uh, issue a statement in the name of the full G20, expressing condolences, but also saying, we'll be there for you on relief uh, and reconstruction. Uh, one of the um, Sherpas um, did think, uh, well, how, didn't we just decide at Pittsburgh? We just do finance and economics, and this looks um, pretty political uh, in a human security or whatever humanitarian kind of way, but that like technical distinction, uh, right, was washed away by the common humanitarian uh, bounding and bonding. Um, Mexico City is not very far from uh, Haiti in a number of um, ways. Uh, the G20 um, didn't come through um, for Japan on March uh, 11 uh, in a similar um, way, but nonetheless, uh, there's an opportunity um, to recall that very recent um, G20 history, uh, those bonds of um, solidarity, uh, and get um, the um, G20 uh, to work uh, for today's Japan uh, as well. What global governance institution can govern, remember the triple disaster, both natural disasters, earthquakes uh, and tsunamis, plus nuclear disasters, um, safety, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Toikimura, right, and uh, now um, Fukushima, plus the known immediate financial and economic um, downsides of the triple part of the triple header that these things um, bring. Uh, well, if the G20 uh, was designed to do finance and economics, um, right, uh, why wouldn't you start there and then uh, govern in ways that um, deal with um, what are now the um, precursors, uh, right? But the economic and finance problem, as I started with, um, still um, remains. So 20 people, uh, there's always the opportunity for them to um, get it right. But we always have to remember that um, Calderon is a lame duck host on his um, way out. So it'll take um, some uh, ingenuity, I think, to get the governors um, to do um, what um, could be done there. Time for perhaps two more questions, one more from the web. If the United States does indeed pivot to an Asia-Pacific defense priority, will Japan's strategic position in the world be enhanced? Pivot. Well, um, first question is, um, what are they going to pivot? And with long memories of um, Asian security um, going back, uh, let's say, to uh, December uh, 1941, um, what do they pivot? Uh, attack aircraft carrier um, squadrons, well, how useful have they been um, in the various um, security uh, problems that we still confront? One of the big issues uh, for the um, G8 is what do we do uh, in Afghanistan for the transformational decade uh, that lies um, ahead? And all the American attack aircraft carrier squadrons in the world actually were not of much use in having us not lose so far 
uh, and uh, that war and um, winning um, the peace. They could have been very useful uh, in Libya, uh, right? Uh, but uh, on the whole, they were uh, very little uh, used. Uh, great for disaster relief, uh, right? The Asian um, tsunami. So uh, you think of the um, critical um, capabilities um, there. Uh, but if you go to, uh, and I'm an old line realist, um, Hans Morgenthau, the ultimate factor of national power is the quality of diplomacy. Uh, right? So I hope they uh, pivot. Um, the diplomacy and the best diplomats um, they've got. And um, problem number one um, for me, yes, I know, territory on that, or as it did in Westphalia, too. Uh, but it's the North Korean um, nuclear um, program, or uh, the human security disaster of the uh, famine, or anything that can roll out from uh, whatever a combination of the two. Um, to um, get that one right, um, you need the combined talents of all the frontline uh, states. And here I don't think, uh, we might begin with the United States because we're here in uh, North America, but the frontline states are pretty clear. It's Japan, it's Korea, it's China, and uh, perhaps Russia um, too. So um, what uh, global governance clubs uh, would you need to provide um, maybe second level support for what they um, might um, come to consensus on um, together, have um, dialogues uh, about? Uh, they're all in the G20, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, but if, uh, you know, North Korean uh, problems uh, like the nuclear program or um, uh, the China, if they're too rich for the great division of uh, labor, um, why can't the G20 uh, start with uh, food security? That's big on the agenda at Las Cabas and at Camp David. Food security uh, means ultimately um, people shouldn't starve, right? So why don't we start there? Uh, and um, work it um, out from there, again, as a toehold, right, to try and um, add um, value. So in my world, um, those would be the uh, kind of questions uh, I'm uh, asking more broadly outside of um, global governance. I, I lived in a world where you had to ask the um, hardcore questions if, um, I guess, these would be the um, June 25th, uh, 19. Uh, 50 questions so the day the uh, Korean War um, began. If the, um, if the balloon goes up and the sirens start to weigh, uh, who is going to fight on um, whose side? And um, by my quick count, if it's China that needs an ally, who can they count on? Um, maybe North Korea. If North Korea needs an ally, who can they count on? Um, conceivably, uh, China, but nobody else. Uh, but who can um, Japan count on? Or the Republic of uh, Korea, uh, everybody uh, else, uh, including, I would say, um, Canada as uh, well as. Um, so in terms of the basic uh, balance of power, uh, right, to the extent that the North Korean regime is at all a rational um, calculator and uh, to the extent is uh, important, uh, I don't feel uh, particularly um, insecure about Asian security. And I hope that the Americans uh, would not abandon in their um, diplomatic and uh, physical assets, um, those which they might usefully have um, approximately to, oh, let's say the Persian Gulf, the Straits of Hormuz, or even closer to um, Syria, um, right? Uh, because it is still a, a great power, which are global um, powers, and they have to worry about all of the world all the time and have the um, forces and the diplomats to be able to solve the um, worst problems that could arise um, there. So go slow, um, United States. Uh, largely, the Asians or uh, the Asians uh, with their Pacific friends, right, um, uh, largely can uh, probably uh, take care of um, the more likely uh, big uh, security problems that could arise over there. I have one last question from the floor. Hi, Keith Heipel from CG and University of Waterloo. Thank you for an excellent presentation. You very nicely stated how J Japan has shown excellent international leadership. Something that gives a country a lot of credibility is how well it treats its own citizens, how fair is a country to its own citizens. Let's say within the G20, how does Japan compare in terms of, let's say, wealth distribution, narrowing the gap between the rich and poor to, to give it a lot of credibility? Uh, less well than it used to. Um, uh, when I started going to Japan, it was an exemplar uh, both in what you saw in the streets and in the uh, OECD statistics of um, income 
a quality uh, relative to um, other countries uh, in the G7 or beyond. Uh, but as I think many people know, uh, Japan too, um, like Canada, uh, like the United States, has moved uh, in the direction of um, income uh, inequality, and there's enough uh, candidates generically to explain uh, why that's happening uh, to pretty much um, all of us. Um, so the question is, um, well, I don't think that is uh, Japan's biggest soft power um, advantage um, at the um, moment. Uh, but it's still got something to um, say um, for um, itself. To the extent that um, relative income equality, together with social security, and by that I mean not just check arrives from Ottawa with a maple leaf on it, um, but your neighbor, all right? the integrity of social um, cohesion. Japan is an overwhelmingly safe place. And if you just step back and look at some of the um, big aggregates of uh, national um, power, uh, hardcore national interests, if I could um, just take us there um, for a moment. Um, how much um, civil strife is there in each of the countries of uh, the G8 or, or um, G20? Uh, I grew up in a world in which, in the case of the United States, there was a great deal. Black Day in July, I guess we Canadians would call it. Now there's almost none. So in some ways, on that core measure, the United States is actually much stronger on the social cohesion right than it was in the 60s and the 70s, and uh, that feeds into the American decline then. Uh, but Japan is still um, pretty much um, as almost perfect uh, as it's been for uh, decades. Uh, yes, there is the um, more silent stuff, you know, suicides in the schools. It comes at a um, cost. Or a bigger question, um, well, let's compare it to its next door uh, neighbor, China, right? Now number uh, two. Um, civil um, strife is a uh, daily occurrence. It's endemic uh, all through the uh, PRC in ways that really worry um, the leadership. So that is um, a big Chinese vulnerability in a category of consequence in which Japan has none. Another question, um, if you're a sovereign state back to Westphalia, you know, the central government uh, should have a single rule of law um, on all of the territorial domain. That's true in Japan. It uh, has been for a very long time. Um, it's not true in India. Uh, it's not true in China, um, right? Uh, and Russia is, um, depending on what's going on in Chechnya and the southern. It's, uh, so on those basic um, political um, sources of capability um, or um, vulnerability, I see extraordinary uh, continuing Japanese um, hardcore um, fundamental um, strength, uh, which you can see uh, feeding through to, um, well, the intervening variables in the uh, jargon of my trade, uh, income inequality, uh, but the uh, sense of social cohesion, the solidarity. And if you needed to stress test that, uh, right? March 11th, um, right? So how did the Japanese people um, react uh, even when, let's say, their governors um, didn't um, react as optimally uh, as they could. Uh, and I think the Japanese people um, get very um, high marks. So uh, beyond the um, inequality, I think there's an extraordinary um, story to be told about the uh, collective uh, resilience uh, and adaptability in the face of the unprecedented of the um, Japanese uh, people. And uh, I suspect that that will be a source of um, soft power um, strength. You can do it comparatively. And of course, um, there's always in danger of being a politically uh, incorrect. Uh, but we think of Haiti. It didn't have the triple header. It just had a uh, natural disaster. And how is that community um, coming through, um, right, or um, others? So uh, once again, um, I think David spoke of the uh, resourcefulness uh, of the Japanese people in, in Japan. I think uh, the more technical um, concept I would use uh, is the resilience uh, and still see um, enormous um, strength that uh, will probably have reputational advantages um, going forward. Um, you can look at the uh, you know world um, surveys of um, public opinion in Japan still is right up there uh, number one or two amongst all in the world as having the uh, number one net positive um, image as a country um, you'd like. So um, 
they may be a little less um, poor, uh, but a lot of the assault power strengths um, are still there and uh, have had um, March 11th um, reinforcements uh, which fit in uh, to a broader um, picture of Japan. Well, John, judging from the questions remaining just from the web audience, let alone from here in the room, we could keep you up all night. What the web audience doesn't know is that the rest of us have had dinner while you've been talking. And so we should give you an opportunity to enjoy dinner. But let me thank you on behalf of all of us uh, here, uh, actually and virtually, for a, really a stunning tour. And the optimistic note is uh, very much appreciated at this anniversary of a very, very dark time. So thank you very much uh, once again. And thanks to the uh, audience uh, here and remotely. I would like to note that the Japan Futures Initiative is entirely dependent on the goodwill and support of other partners and organizations. And tonight, we're fortunate to have a number of uh, supporters that have made this possible. Uh, first and foremost, the Japan Foundation, through a very generous grant, has made this event possible in the first place. Uh, the Center for International Governance Innovation, uh, who is bringing us this uh, webcast and supported us in various other ways as well. Balsley School of International Affairs, providing the venue and the conference logistical support. Uh, the East Asian Studies Program at Renison University College, University of Waterloo. And uh, last but not least, the uh, Shibusawa Eichi Memorial Foundation, which uh, is responsible for my personal interest in Japan dating back now 25 years. So to all of the partners and co-sponsors, thank you very much. And to the audience, uh, thank you as well. Hope you will join us again on another future CG Signature Lecture Series event.